Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us here today. We really appreciate you being here. So thanks for joining us for our second annual Equity and Justice Speaker Series. Today, we have the pleasure of welcoming Brandon Obunu, the third and final speaker in our seminar series. If you missed our previous two series with Joan Roughgarden and Christy Belay, I encourage you to head over to our YouTube channel where all of the videos are for the spring seminar series and from our previous series last year. So I'm Courtney Scarborough. I'm the deputy director here at NCS, which stands for the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis. At NCS, we work to accelerate scientific discoveries that enhance our understanding of the world and benefit people and nature, as well as to transform the scientific culture to be more open, efficient, and collaborative. So for more information about NCS, you can also check out our website. Um, before we begin today, we ask you all to join us in acknowledging the Chumash people who are the environmental stewards of our land on which NCS is located. So we pay our respects to the Chumash people, their elders, past and present and future, who call this place their home. We acknowledge that this land on which we live and work are the traditional homelands of the indigenous peoples, including the Chumash people. This land is the result of erasures and exclusions of indigenous peoples. As we come together to bring awareness to issues of equity and justice, we recognize the Chumash people and so many other indigenous peoples who are fighting to dismantle the legacies of settler colonialism in their tribal territories. As we continue to work towards diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice in data science, we strive to prioritize indigenous data sovereignty and self-determination. Now I will hand it over to Tosh Haycock Chavez to introduce you to our speaker today and give you some logistical information about this presentation. Thanks everybody. Thank you, Courtney, for that introduction. Um, so I'm Natasha Higgot Travis. Everybody calls me Tosh. And I am the Community Engagement and Outreach Coordinator at the NC's Arctic Data Center. And I am delighted today to be introducing and welcoming Brandon Obuno to our spring seminar series. So for all of you joining us on this webinar, um, please feel free to add any questions you may have during the talk through the Q&A button located at the bottom of your screen. And we'll have a moderated Q&A section, including these questions at the end of this presentation. And now I'd like to introduce you to our speaker, Brandon Obunu. Brandon is an assistant professor at the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at Yale University. After obtaining his PhD at Yale in 2010, Brandon completed postdoctoral fellowships at Harvard University and the Broad Institute. He has been the recipient of UNSF Merck the Broad Institute Diversity Fellowship and the Ford Foundation Postdoctoral Fellowship. Brandon's research takes place at the intersection of evolutionary biology, genetics, and epidemiology. He uses experimental evolution, mathematical modeling, and computational biology to better understand diseases' underlying causes and consequences across scales, from the biophysics of proteins involved in drug resistance to the social determinants driving epidemics at the population level. He aims to develop a theory that enriches our understanding of the evolutionary and ecological underpinnings of disease while contributing to practical solutions for clinical medicine and public health. Brandon, we are so excited to have you. Please know that there is a resounding applause on the other side of the, this webinar to welcome you. Take it away. I hear it, I hear it. Thank you, keep the applause, save the applause for the end. I appreciate everyone. Thank you for that introduction. Um, let's get yeah, Thank you for that kind introduction. What a thrill it is to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, the title of my talk today, Environment by Everything Reactions in Disease Ecology, from Indirect Infection to Incarceration and Beyond. And we will cover quite a bit of ground. Uh, I ran and got my coffee, so you're going to see true New Yorker Brandon come out, and the, the words will come out, and believe it or not, I think they'll make sense, and I think the aim today is to cover uh, a lot of different areas uh, of my program and the way that I think about the world uh, that intersect nicely with the theme of this great seminar series. Before doing any of that, the most important part of any seminar, of course, the acknowledgments, all of the institutions and staff, 
and people who have supported my work in various ways through the years. My work is really, really kind of iterative and it goes back quite some time and all of these institutions have helped. Uh, obviously, right, to this great institution, to all of the, and I, these, are just, these are just a few of the people that I interacted with over email. If I didn't get you, I apologize. But I think all of you who put together this institute, put together this lecture series, it is intimida intimidatingly awesome, the other speakers. Uh, the notion that I you know, should be here to talk about my work is really quite humbling. So thank you for thinking of me and really more than anything having to do with me, congratulations on what you are doing here. I think what makes this uh, particular seminar series so special uh, is the way that it intersects uh, the social justice with the technical work. And I think that's a frontier. And I think if there's anything I would define my research program by, it's partly that. Uh, but really, thank you all for uh, everything. A large library of supporters and friends and mentors and mentees who became mentors. I mean, uh, you know, that, as some of you have been around long enough know how that works. All of those people who've contributed to this work formally and informally, many of them can't be mentioned, but I want to make sure at least some of them are properly acknowledged. The work that you're going to hear spans really almost a decade, and you're going to kind of get introduced to various components of this work along the way. But the great thing about seminars, as you all, as many of you know, is that seminars can be like a remix of your past work. You can kind of like take two songs here and put them with two songs here, and you can play a new, and you can kind of tell a new story in some ways uh, by doing just that. So you're going to kind of get a lot of that. So fundamentally right what is it that we're going to discuss here or how's it going to work we're going to ask the question is what is the ecology of disease exactly that's kind of one of the central questions we're going to ask and how do i use that as a model problem to think about right, these uh not only cutting edge technical questions in ecology but questions in ecology that interface with uh with social justice how does a reconsideration of what an environment is change how we think about disease ecology and what are some modern problems where that's this is relevant? This is really what we're going to cover today. And to do that, right, we have this agenda. We're going to talk about my research program. We're going to get a tour through the way that I developed my interests. And I feel like this is a, a part, particularly for junior scientists and junior scholars and junior citizen scientists. They want to know how you arrived at these things. That's going to be a character in this story. Then we'll talk through some data and some things that I actually do, and we'll talk about some modern applications. Now, my research program to the boring part, not, not the boring part, but in terms of it's, it, this is not boring, this is fun, but describing it can be boring and stale in the sense of this is my research program. I have an evolution of infectious disease research program and I have kind of an ecology infectious disease research program. And we're mostly gonna live with this part of the program today. And if you know it's this lowercase e ecology for a reason, I'm kind of like, I'm not an ecologist the way some of you are, but I certainly use ecological principles and theory in thinking about disease. And fundamentally it's this question of how does the interaction between hosts and environments influence what we understand about epidemics, the shape of epidemics. And what I'm gonna to argue today is that just this simple framing right here is really, really rich in an uh, area where we can kind of discuss not only cutting edge technical questions, but again, social justice concerns. This notion of what an environment is, is obviously right, uh, is a foundational concept in all of ecology. If I ask all the individuals that I see here, uh, you know, Dr. Galaz Garcia and uh, some of the others, if I ask you, what, how, does the, in, how does the environment manifest in your work? Well, we would all have our own, I mean, some of us would have shared definitions, but we encode it and think about it differently in our work. So for some of you, you might be in ecological genomics or you might be in quantitative genetics. You might think about the environment this way in the sense of this crowd, of course, knows this is a reaction norm. This could be, I don't know, uh, how tall a blade, you know, a grass strain of grass grows and this could be temperature or something like that. The idea is this is a framing we use to think about what an environment is now, in this context, you know, there's not a lot of biology in here. So some of us who are quantitative, purely quantitatively inclined, really just care about the information so that we can think about problems like variance decomposition and what have you. So that's one framing of the environment that some of us use in the fields of ecology and evolution and environmental sciences. That's kind of that's going to be relevant to our questions. 
What are some other framings of the environment that are relevant to us, right? It could be this. Now, this is one of the places that I live. This is like a micro environment, some people will call this. Say you have a protein that you're interested in or some kind of biomolecule that you're interested in. You're interested in way temperature influences the way that protein, in this case, an enzyme, is you know, functioning. It's catalyzing you know, some type of reaction of some kind. So sometimes you're thinking about environment, right? Really on a micro scale. What are the small things that dictate and drive the phenomenon of interest? Another framing environment to scale back out, this one I'm obviously friendly to this community, and we heard this in one of the, I think, the second seminar. I mean, yeah, I mean, this is obviously, right, a scaling, and we can, you know, we can think about what this is, temperature, in terms of climactic and global change ecology and ecosystems ecology. Basically, you have forces that are occurring globally and ge on the geological or climactic or global scale are influencing our phenomenon. But obviously, this is a highly, highly relevant one. And these are kind of things that I think about in my work. And you know, like I already talked about this one is kind of most firmly, but you know, these certainly play a role in things like epidemics. But most recently, and I think what I want to argue in this talk is that there are other dimensions that are also relevant in my case to disease ecology, but also I would suggest to your questions. And that involves this type of dimension. So that's the Queensbridge houses in New York City. I'm from New York City, I'm not from the Queensbridge houses, but this is home to some of my heroes. And the idea here is you think about this housing complex, right? One of the fundamental questions is what is it about this environment that gave birth to some of the greatest wordsmiths the species has ever seen? But of course, there's even biology going on here. There's a tree here, and of course, there's a field of urban ecology and urban you know, evolution that thinks about what is it about kind of the ecosystem of this environment that may influence the organisms. But the idea here is this ecosystem is, of course, influencing right, us as people as well. And I think there is, there's that a new field that's beginning to think about this. But then I want to add a dimension to the environment to this, which is related to this one, but it's more historical. And that would be this one. This is an individual drinking out of a uh, segregated water fountain in Oklahoma City in the 1930s. And of course, as you know, and this, even though this is, this is Oklahoma City and this is New York City, um, we know these are related. These kind of types of housing complexes didn't pop up overnight and where people live in certain settings and the types of resources they're exposed to uh, did not pop up overnight. These are the product of historical forces and contemporary forces that kind of create and craft uh, where people live and of course kind of our and their imaginations and our imaginations. Right. And really what I say the way I think about this is when we think about what an environment is, we can reframe this as an environment by, by everything interaction. It doesn't matter what our problem is, all of these are factors in it. I heard the land acknowledgement, which was very quite profound, right? Uh, to start this presentation. And that is important because we do not study, I don't care if you study Lepid, you know, Lepidoptera, I don't care if you study moss, all of that study takes place on land and that land has its own history. And what I argue is that regardless of where we are, all and what we study, all of these are in our, our dimension here. Now, of course, when we think about what the environment is and the way that it's influencing our questions of interest, be it disease or be it kind of conservation or be it, you know, uh, you know, uh, marine or aquatic systems, or what have you, um, it can be intimidating. Like, how do I actually disentangle how I don't know a fish that I'm studying in a in a, in a you know in you know in Lake Michigan? is influenced by these various forces that can be intimidating, right? But we are talking about environment in different ways. What I argue is that we can lean into this just because the environment is something that we all have different definitions of. And just because the environment is something that we consider or measure or bundle or bend differently or regress differently, doesn't mean that right we have to be without it. Sometimes people think, oh, well, if it's complicated in some ways, then the goal of my analysis is to control for it. What I argue is the opposite. We should lean into what environments are because they say something very meaningful about our systems. So right, we introduced you to kind of the way I think about things, that environmental interaction component. I'm really interested in that across the board. If you go to a different talk of mine where I'm talking about protein evolution and antibiotic resistance, I'll give you a different framing of that, how drug environments influence the evolution of antibiotic resistance. But here we're getting kind of the, the, the ecological level, how kind of in, environmental interactions are crafting epidemics and kind of and society. Next, I'll take you how I arrived at my interest, which is very, very kind of uh, tied to the purpose of this seminar, because it is absolutely some of the forces that I described that influenced why I'm interested in some of these questions at all. And so where should we begin? We'll begin here, right? 
we'll begin with my introduction to the ecology of infectious disease. And we'll start with a completely different part of life uh, that I was in, where my, I talked about imagination, right? I think where I lived was someplace not entirely dissimilar from the Queensbridge House. And certainly we thought differently about who I was and what my capabilities were. And really it starts here. And yes, that's me at 17 years old. Uh, I mourn the hair, but whatever. Uh, I want to point out we beat them 24 to nothing. And you know, I just, just because, I just want to mention that just because. Uh, but the point is, here I am, a high school football player, and that's a kind of a standard 17 year old facial expression for those of you who know 17 year old. But more than that, I'm supposed to be happy because we won and shut them out, but I'm suffering from a really bad case of athlete's foot. Okay. And of course, like any sophisticated uh, high school student, I did, right, I blamed the hockey team because they were, they were filthy. But <laughs> unlike us, sophisticated football players. But this was my introduction to the ecology of infectious disease, right? Because my coach, right, Coach Al, who, and that's not actually Coach Al, that's Denzel Washington from Remember the Titans, but he'll be Coach Al for this presentation. Coach Al actually said to me and screamed at all the linebackers, he said, watch out for the shower. There are bad things on the floor sitting and waiting for you. Now, this was the first time I had ever been exposed to the notion that an infectious disease could spread through the environment. Not necessarily from person to person, but from person to the environment to another person, that this route of transmission existed at all. Until then, of course, yeah, I remember this is, well, we'll get there, but this is the HIV AIDS era, right? And so that was kind of the, the infectious disease picture that was in my head. But the notion that the environment can be a reservoir for infection is something I hadn't heard of, okay? And at a homage to Coach Al, 100% true, at a homage to Coach Al, I actually kind of uh, developed this mathematical framework that we use to study infectious diseases where you have kind of this environmental component where the actual transmission event is occurring from the environmental source or a reservoir or a surface or water or what have you. And we weren't the first or the only people to do this. This was in some ways just kind of an exercise, but I think this is an example of the type of work that we did. I became very interested in these types of diseases where they have this environmental transmission component, okay? But of course, you know, this Coach Al anecdote is true about me playing football and, and what that is and how that really, you know, laid a hammer into my senior year uh, of high school. But there are also scientific experiences that I've had between that. I gave you kind of an original experiential origin for why I'm interested in disease ecology. But there are also some scientific things. And for my dissertation work, I actually did work on virus infections that actually have to survive in the environment. So I actually did an evolution experiment and selected for viruses that have to survive in the environment, as in they have to sit and wait in the environment before encountering a host. And this is what we found is a deeply underappreciated route of transmission in infectious disease. All right, and this is one that I've kind of built a lot of my interests on. And this is, of course, with Paul Turner, my PhD advisor now, uh, department colleague, right? And so we, right, we, so in, from this work, we found out that viruses can be selected for and the mechanism, right? Uh, but how important and essential an idea is this? I mean, you, you, we could publish papers on this and I could kind of build a mathematical framework for it. But how essential and important is it? Well, it turns out, right, as I began to think, right, it turns out to be relevant for a lot of types of diseases. Now, the reason why, part of the reason why I had this here, I actually wrote an article. Um, reflecting on the fact that it's been 30 years since Magic Johnson's announcement that he was HIV positive. And, and I was young, but I was, I was of age and I remember what that was like. I mean, I mean I'm young, I, was, I'm, I'm, I remember what it was like and what, what, how big a deal that was. And, you know, and in this, 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 these type, this experience, my experience growing up during the crack epidemic, knowing individuals who were infected by virtue of being, you know, injection, you know, people who were injecting drugs, had a very, very big impact on who I was. And so I carried along this interest in, right, in the way diseases are spread through pe persons who inject drugs in that community and addiction, what have you. And I began to think about ways, right, that we can connect this, right? And of course, right, this remains relevant today. I think this, of course, is, you know, 20 and 30 and 10 years ago. I remember why I first got interested in the context of hepatitis C virus and the context of a heroin epidemic, as we know now, this is manifesting in the context of a opioid uh, use disorder crisis. And as we see here, we're now worried because of the pandemic that this is gonna be uh, a bigger problem. 
So the connection here is that you have these diseases that are spread through kind of an instrument, right? A physical instrument that is not unlike in some ways, it's characteristic some ways of the floor of my locker room, right? When I was in high school. And so I've carried through this thing about how we think about opioid crisis and in and, 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 and the relationship between it and HIV. There's been several kind of uh, HIV outbreaks in communities of persons who inject drugs. And certainly we're now worried about outbreaks of hepatitis C virus in, in, in populations of persons who inject drugs in the context of the opioid crisis. So, you know, you create this kind of, uh, you know, framework to think about infectious disease, thinking about one set of problems, and because of the way the world has changed, it becomes relevant to something else. And so one of the things, right, so you see here multiple motivations, they go back to high school, they're kind of historical and personal, and they're kind of very, very scientific. I think one of the things that we did with this work, right, we began to think about, okay, we have a framework now to understand infectious diseases that are spread through the environment. I told you about what their historical origins were. I've told you now that they might have this relevance to kind of persons who inject drugs. So we took this model here and we began to think about, right, diseases like hepatitis C virus that they call the silent killer. We call it the silent killer for multiple reasons. Part of it is because even though it's wreaking havoc physiologically, many, many individuals do not demonstrate symptoms for many, many decades, even though it is causing problems. It can cause liver failure nonetheless. But more than that, part of the reason why it's the silent killer is because of the people who it infects, at least in the Western world and now increasingly everywhere. And that is um, you know, the, the people who inject drugs community, it's a community that has been largely marginalized, criminalized historically. And because of that, we actually don't have a good picture of kind of what the ecology of disease really, really is, okay? And so what I say was, okay, well, let's take this, right, this idea of you have syringes that are responsible for spreading hepatitis C and HIV in these communities of individuals. And I said, let's compare it mathematically in some ways. Let's take our model and compare it to a mosquito. Because in some ways it has properties of, again, it has properties of the gym floor where I got, right, where I got athlete's foot but it also has properties of mosquito in the sense if it's moving around. Now, of course, it's not alive. There's not reproduction taking place within it. And of course, you know, like I said, you know, mosquitoes are a highly sophisticated biological entity, but it has some of the features. And this is exactly what we did. So we published this manuscript. We actually used our model and we used some literature from kind of vector control to come up with a better model to describe how hepatitis C virus, right, is spreading in persons who inject drugs. And in doing so, what we did here, and you know, you know, you know, is basically the, the key thing to understand here is that we modeled needles as their own set of dynamics. And this is, we're not the first people to do this, but we, I think, we're the first people to recently do it in the context of hepatitis C virus. If you model one of the first people to do it that way, if you model uh, needles as their own compartment, you now have an, a new lens on how to potentially control. And so, using this model, we now have better understanding of how it is and why that. Uh, um, needle exchange programs work certain ways. Why, uh, for example, uh, safe injection sites, which are this institution whereby individuals who are addicted to a substance are able to do so using clean drug paraphernalia. And of course, that, that fits under the umbrella of the set of interventions we call harm reduction. Okay. So what we see here, right, is um, what we see here is this this use of this model to answer these questions. Now, of course, part of the problem with this, as many of you know, in ecologists, you all are extremely smart when it comes to your modeling. I have this kind of compartment here for susceptible individuals. And of course, that's people who inject drugs. But of course, as you know, people who inject drugs are not kind of a homogenous population, right? There's a lot of nuance with regards. The problem with the person who inject drug community is the way that the networks are formed. And so I was able to kind of think about other ways to model this that really sit down on the fact that individuals are connected to individuals. And by using that, you begin to think like, all right, well, there's certain types of drugs, for example, that have larger networks than others. And using this, we've been able to kind of come up with certain types of uh, studies that basically say, okay, if we have a, a network, and this is built kind of based on a a real known injection drug network. If you have a network of individuals and this one person is highly, highly connected, that's the red ones are higher connected. 
If you can have more personalized and pointed intervention, maybe you can do something more about the disease. Maybe you can actually have a bigger effect, right? And that's one of the things that we've uh, demonstrated, right? What we talked about here is we can leverage what we know about users, right? We can ask questions about whether network science can inform how we pursue these types of interventions. And that's exactly what we found just as a quick result. What we do is we say we had this, this is kind of a random treatment as in you identify, you, you treat people randomly here across this network. This is where your random treatment, but, but you're centralizing um, some harm reduction strategies as in you're putting harm reduction strategies. What this line is, is the additive effect of uh, uh, centralizing uh, some targeted interventions, safe injection sites and safe, safe injection sites, again, are the thing where individuals can, in, can inject drugs. If you target and centralize safe injection sites, you get this kind of bump, this non-linear non -linear interaction between these two things where you get an additional benefit. So the idea is target interventions are better for these types of things. I think only network science and a network perspective could have given, that, uh, given us that understanding on the ecology of disease. So what we have here is, again, starting with a personal experience, start with my coach Al, We've developed a mathematical framework. We've seen how my dissertation work about evolving viruses in the environment influences that. We've taken that model now, and we've now walked that into right, a really cutting edge you know, social problem, which is addiction. Um, and I think it's been relevant to disease. We can model things like e e from the heroin uh, epidemic to the opioid use disorder epidemic that's modern. And we can say something meaningful about wow, the way we can intervene in these things, again, based on an ecological understanding of the way this type of disease functions. But there are many other kind of applications, right? So I, you know, so again, in the, in the context of hepatitis C virus, we modeled needles independently. We can also do that for, you know, water supplies in the context of cholera, okay? And one of the things that we've done is we've now, we're in the process of the, the, we're thinking about this. When we think about cholera outbreaks around the world, Right, what you hear is, okay, you have a cholera outbreak here and here. And what we're actually in the process, what our models are demonstrating is that there's actually a little bit of a taxonomy of cholera outbreaks, right? We call, we, we, there's three times, there's a, there's a DACA style, DACA Bangladesh style of cholera outbreak. There's a kind of a, there was a massive kind of uh, outbreak that followed the Haitian um, uh, earthquake several years ago. And I think that's a different type of outbreak. And then you have them, uh, outbreaks in temporary settlements, we're also formerly known as refugee camps. And the idea here is that in DACA, cholera is endemic, as in, right, it's kind of there, it kind of comes, it comes with these storms, and it's kind of here reliably every year. Because of those particulars and the ecological specifics of the way that Vibrio cholera is interacting with this setting, the interventions that you need are going to be quite different. In the Haitian uh, outbreak from several years ago, the problem was an interruption and disruption in the water quality, again, by virtue of an earthquake that happened. Turns out the interventions are going to be quite different there, which are, are themselves much, much different than temporary, set, temporary settlements. And so now we can identify, right, we can actually look at kind of how the networks are connected in these types of places. Um, and we can actually use this to, to target different therapies. So for example, um, you know, uh, uh, hand sanitizer and these types of things like that, um, uh, you know, uh, water, you know, water treatment and things of that nature are going to be a lot less effective in places where, right, where you have a temporary settlement. Uh, it turns out hand washing and types of hygiene is much more effective in places where, that are endemic. And so the idea that there's a one size fits all approach, it's just like any kind of ecological problem. You have to understand particulars to be able to generate a responsible response. Okay. Right. So what I've shown you again, just to summarize again, experiential, social and experimental origins of my interest in diseases spread through the environment and the ecology of disease. I've showed you some computational epidemiological uh, portions of my research program. We've talked about using weight models to think about hepatitis C virus transmission in the context of thinking about different needles. We've talked about a waste style network model to say something very specific about how we can target specific individuals and places in a network with regards to interventions for hepatitis C transmission in populations of individuals who inject drugs. And then I just demonstrated to you that we use the same modeling framework to think about kind of how we can rethink 
um, cholera outbreaks and maybe develop a taxonomy because different settings have different types of outbreak. All again from one basic, relatively basic ecological model for thinking about disease transmission, okay? Right. And so one of the things that we've thought about here, we've extended this analogy, right? So we have this model here that we've used to think about, right? We have this model that we to model kind of uh, the way uh, needles are circulating in a population. But what about outbreaks and problems that are not like short-term in the sense of, we don't, what if we're not worried about an outbreak, a local outbreak happening tomorrow or next year? What if we're thinking about gl more global scale changes? What are things in nature that might be kind of transmitting or, or, or moving diseases, right? We talked about that, but what about things like birds? And this is a new, really, really exciting arena of my research program. We now are taking, we are now developing a research program where we're actually measuring, it's actually under study, the way uh, wild and, and domesticated birds are actually a type of vector for vibrios, like vibrio collar and other types of vibrios that cause vibriosis. And we recently put out this working paper that will be a book chapter and a book on cholera uh, vibrio, vibrio dynamics. And the idea here, this is under study. It turns out that a lot of different wild bird species and, and domesticated bird species are carrying uh, vibrios of various kinds. And as you know, as climate change happens, of course, um, we're worried about kind of the range expansion. And you know, we actually haven't had like a really, really localized cholera outbreak, right, in the, in the United States as far as we've been measuring. But the idea here is as climate change happens, as uh, bird range ex uh, happens, expansion happens, this is now be, be, be something that we need to think about and just globally we need to think more about. So again, waterborne, this framework, and now we have this birds as vectors for vibrios, all starting from one kind of modeling framework. Now, I think, right, that's where a lot of the ecology of disease wor work in the lab. That's the classical stuff that we've done in the sense of that's the basic science program that we have. We have a program where we're continuing to model indirectly transmitted diseases, right? But of course, the world hasn't been the same recently, which is why I'm not in sunny, beautiful Santa Barbara right now. And I'm sitting in, let's say, not quite as beautiful New Haven, Connecticut, right? And that's because of course, right, of this. Now, as somebody who studies virus evolution, when this happened, I had a lot of decisions to make. I said, okay, well, do I wanna pivot my whole research program towards COVID the way a lot of people did? And I think admirably so. Well, frankly, I felt a bit of imposter syndrome. And I was like, I don't feel like that. I don't feel like I could really add anything there. So what did I do? Instead of kind of immediately pivoting, and we did end up publishing a bunch of papers on this, I actually started doing public engagement. And these are two of my closest colleagues, Sinai Yitbarak, uh, he's an ecology of disease person and really magnificent for people that you might want to engage in the future. And Pluny Pennings, one of my scientific heroes, who's now a, a close collaborator. And really it was Bluny Pennings uh, who had led this charge. But early in the pandemic, really early, when we really didn't know much, we basically read all the literature and we put out like these videos, which have now been viewed millions of times. And we actually just educated people with regards to kind of how this actually works. Um, and a lot of us just kind of stood up, stood, to, stood up through time more or less. I mean, and this was like April of 2020. And so we did things like this. We did things like this. We talked about it can spread this day. And we did this, we talked about snuffing creatures to cut costs, using coughing and creating droplets. Of course, this was a little bit controversial then, but it's true. All right. And you know, this one we were wrong about. But nonetheless, we 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 really did a lot of work. Now, of course, my research program did end up working on this. Okay. We did end up kind of uh, uh, publishing several papers on um, on you know SARS-CoV-2 virulence evolution and and things of that nature. So it's not like we were stay, we stayed completely out of it, but it really was the public engagement was the thing that infected me the most. And I like to say about myself is in the context of SARS-CoV-2, I'm one of these, I'm not quite retired, but I'm taking a little bit of vacation. I'm one of these misinformation warriors, particularly from the vaccine era. And so what I did from November really to March, November, 2020 to March, 2021, I spent, between two and 10 hours a day, some days, 
trying to get people vaccinated, in particular in Black and Brown communities. And the idea there is in digital spaces, I engage, I answer questions. Um, and that became a very, very central part of who I was. Now, in the, part, in the process of doing that, we were learning more about the pandemic. And as you all know, um, the skepticism that I ran up against when I was trying to educate people about the pandemic was not independent of the shape of the pandemic. Okay, so for example, right, individual communities that were being disproportionately affected were the ones, like, it, it, sometimes, it, it seems like a paradox. Why would the communities most affected be the most skeptical of institutions? So but you, you think about that for 10 seconds, and it's like, well, exactly. Communities that have had a lot of reason to distrust institutions and distrust science are the ones, right, are the ones that are going to be disproportionately affected. And this had a really, really big effect on me. Because this start, I, I started to, and this is that's something I learned during the pandemic. I knew about these forces, but I really, really leaned my research program and my my activism and my um, and my uh, advocacy towards educating communities and begin, be, beginning to lean into the interaction between the pandemic and what is actually happening here and here. Of course, this staggeringly high rate in the indigenous community did not happen because of biology. And trust me, I'm a geneticist. If it was, that would make my job easier if it was a gene that did it. But we looked and it's not, okay? The reason why certain communities in the United States right, have this disproportionate rate is due to the normal suite of structural right, violence that we've seen that as the signature of disease and has been the same sector, sec, sec, the same structural violence that created this, and the same structural violence that found its origin here that's affected many communities since this country's inception. Right. So having thought about this, what did I do next? And I think this is another thing I developed in some ways, and this predates the pandemic, but it's the product of the intersection between the pandemic and the George Floyd era is some of you know, right, I began to kind of think very deeply right, about the interaction between who I am and the science that I perform. And this, is be, this has grown from just an interest and an advocacy thing to a true pillar of my research program. And now I say admittedly that there are very blurred lines between these informal activities and the new technical arenas. I want to emphasize that because I said it at the beginning of this talk. And again, this is one of the reasons why I applaud this series in this institution is that the tech, right? The, the political is the technical, right? The, the, the social justice is the technical. If you want to understand these phenomena from a technical perspective, you have to understand the way these forces work. And so I began to lean my research program in this direction. So, right? But of course, that starts biographically. That starts with who we are. And I try to think very personally about who I am and why that's, that, that is what it is. And of course, you know, for me, right, we, we ask questions. How can we more carefully use data science to study these types of social systems? How can I be a more responsible citizen scientist in this biographical, right? And with me, it starts here. It's my mother. And she raised me. And, you know, I talk about my mother all the time now. So if you're rolling your eyes, I don't care, right? Because the idea here is that my mother right, really did set the agenda for me with regards to the way that an environment is crafting the possibility for an individual. I kind of saw the way social constraints, right, uh, you know, got in the way of her ability to maximize her potential, and I think I lived with that. And so one of the ways that I, right, and one of the ways that happens is because of where we lived in an environment not dissimilar from this one. And of course, about history, you know, my mother experienced the tail end of Jim Crow when she visited her family in North Carolina. She's from Baltimore and a very deeply segregated Baltimore. So this has kind of sat with me as a kind of a, a guiding light for the way that I live my life. But I began to kind of now uh, crystallize this into my research life. And one of the ways I've done that is I tell stories. Some of you are familiar with these. I tell stories, but the real way I do it is I write. That's the real way that I write. So I'm a columnist at Wired. Some of you might know, I write to places like the Boston Review and Scientific American. I write about kind of the intersection between sports and race and culture and disease. I wrote these kind of foundational articles about the, about the epidemic, about the NBA bubble and epidemiology. But one of the things that's been really, really fun in my column at Wired is I'm able to explore, right, very, very kind of socially relevant things. I got many people got mad at me for this one, where I basically made fun of everyone for becoming a COVID researcher overnight. 
I've talked a lot about scientific racism. This is another kind of big theme in what I look at, but it was this one here, right, that I wrote really early, where I began to kind of connect what we were doing from an intervention perspective with the pandemic to, right, the growing protest movement around uh, George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, right? And that was the thing that got me reading really, really carefully and in detail about the intersection between disease um, and social justice and social institutions, right? And that led me to kind of write this manuscript, which was about, right, I, I, I looked at data that was on prisons and incarceration. And, you know, as you see here, um, you know, this really is a, this is, this is an ecology paper, right? I'm talking about how structural ecology and the way that the cross of state is structures, structured um, really, really kind of isn't really, the way we talk about disease now, we need new language when we're talking about the pandemic. And this is the first time I actually leaned into this type of work. And it was published in a, you know, a health humanities journal and I, I really enjoyed it and I got good feedback, but it was this work that led to really the final pillar of my research that we'll talk about today. And that is uh, this work that's now in revision. Uh, this paper, the COVID-19 pandemic amplified longstanding racial disparities in the United States criminal justice system. Now, what's happening with this paper, which is fascinating, again, you're seeing the thing, just to bring you all the way back, right? Athlete's foot, <laughs> okay, right? And, and, you know, and, you know, and, you know, that culminating in me thinking about the way infectious diseases are transmitted in peculiar and, un, un, you know, in unusual ways. That being used as a model to think about the intersection between disease models and social phenomenon like addiction, right? Like the persons who inject drug community, like harm reduction, like climate change, like, uh, you know, like uh, temporary settlements. Social forces are influencing epidemic dynamics in a lot of ways. But what this paper is, is that it's not so much that social forces are influencing epidemics, it's that epidemics are influencing social forces. Right. And really, this is some of the most exciting work of my career. So a couple of things I want to point out about this paper, the disciplines of the individuals involved. So uh, mathematical biologist, mathematical biologist, history graduate student. I think some of them are, these are data scientists, physician, artificial intelligence, epidemiology, and history and law. So a deeply integrative, and, and, and this is one of the things that I call for when we're thinking about ways to make a, a true dent in these types of problems, this type of multidisciplinarity. And so I'll briefly go through what it is that we looked at, right? All right. The, what we're talking about here is a complex story based on two key observations which really drive the paper. And that is, this is total state prison population, right, in the, in the, in the, in the country, as in, in state prisons in the country. The pandemic was actually the greatest decarceration event in the history of the country. Yeah. More people were let out during the pandemic, right? And a lot of that was due to these formal decarceration policies, which had this public health flavor, which is a good thing. So this is the overall drop, but watch this. If you look at the percent of the population that are black and incarcerated, that went up during the pandemic. So while the overall numbers went down, Black and Latino representation in prisons went up. How? And the question is charged with answering that question with that. So why do we observe this trend? Why do we observe the trend in B? If we think so, how would we show that there's a reason? What data would we need to do it? And so this was a data science extravaganza. It involved foyers, calling state departments, to departments of corrections, talking to legislators, talking to attorneys, talking to courts. We got this massive amount of data, right? And we asked the questions. What, if anything, does this tell us about mass incarceration in the US? Does it inform action? And how does the ecology help us understand this? This is one of the things that, this is really what this paper was charged with. And there's a lot in this study, and you can actually go read the working paper now if you'd like to. It is in, it, it, it's, it's out on uh, Med Archive, even though the, the paper now is in revision. Uh, at a journal, one of the things we looked at was multiple mechanisms. So if you think about what can cause a drop in a prison population, right? Um, right what we actually looked at a bunch of different things that could have explained this. And we came up with three, there are three main mechanisms that we've identified that could be causative. 
And I think they could be contributing in different ways. One is court closures. During the pandemic, like a lot of, like, and during lockdown, a lot of things closed, including courts. Now, what happens when courts closes? Percentage of defendants dismiss cases. If cases are dismissed, okay, if cases are dismissed and or are settled via plea, we have data that's already demonstrated that pleas are racially biased against black and brown individuals. So if the courts are closed and you're settling more cases with a biased mechanism, then right, even if you're letting people out, you're going to have a disproportionate flux in and out by virtue of race, right? So that's one mechanism that we've identified that's at work in certain states. And this is Florida. This is Florida, this is Florida as a case study. Another mechanism is that disparities in police interactions. It turns out that in certain places after the pandemic, because of where people work, in terms of structural, because of jobs, because of these types of things, individuals actually had a heightened sense interactions with police. This is white individuals. Look at the pandemic down because of work, because of the types of jobs that they have. If you talk about Black and Latinos after uh, after the pandemic, boom, it goes up until after the lockdown. So the idea is there's an increased police interaction and contact rate with individuals right after lockdown. And the third mechanism we talk about is releases. And this was kind of the original hypothesis. This is data from Arkansas. If you look at the eligibility requirements for who got out, they were many of them were biased in favor of white individuals who were there. And that could be how long you were in, that could be the type of crime. And of course, even those things in terms of how long you were supposed to, time you're supposed to serve is bias in and of itself. So these biases influence other biases and all of that in some skewed and created this extremely troublesome and confusing, uh, but fascinating uh, phenomenon here. So what we see here is a complex story of ecology. It's the interaction between historical forces that created these laws, the current policies, actual racism in terms of things like um, you know, biases in, in terms of who gets uh, who gets released or police interactions, and of course, structural violence. But one of the things we argue in this study is that the pandemic served as a stress test. And that's one of the things we learned from ecology. The idea is that sometimes, right, uh, in a system, in a complex system, when it's under duress, when it's squeezed in some kind of way, all of the forces that are operating underneath it Right, manifest loudly. And that's one of the things that have, has dem we've demonstrated in this study. And I think it, the, 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 there is a kind of a, a technical complex systems that some social systems are complex and we need these types of data science tools to understand them. But they also kind of serve to demonstrate how, what the signature is of kind of these types of environmental forces and how they craft our sense of being, our sense of possibility, health, and wealth. I think I left a few minutes. I think I left 10 minutes for questions. I appreciate everything in your time and I look forward to a conversation. Sorry, hey. I'm still on mute. <laughs> Thank you so much for that incredible talk. I hope you know that there's a huge applause <laughs> from behind. I can hear it. <laughs> um, I'm going to give a couple of minutes for people to type in their questions, um, but that was really fascinating. I wish we had a whole another hour to just keep listening to you about all hey, of Write me back. Write me back <laughs> when I can come, when I can actually come and have a good time in Santa Barbara. I love Santa Barbara. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Okay, I see a question. Oh, yeah, we got some questions coming up. Um, so the first question is, do you know why the Latinx population has a similar COVID mortality rate as the white population? Well, so this is a good question. So let's have some fun with this question, okay? <laughs> um, part, of the, part of the question here is, what do we mean by Latinx? And I think if you disaggregate, you're probably not, you're, you're going to see, you're, like, I think aggregation is a problem with all of these types of demographic statistics. Um, I, I think that uh, 
part of that is <laughs> it, it, it's complicated. So the answer is we don't know, right? I, I, there's no like slam dunk answer to that question. I think that has to do with kind of the heterogeneity in the data. I think there's certain right, pop, I think I think you know I think the Caribbean Latinx population are much different than kind of like the indigenous um, Latinx population in the Southwest, for example, where their rates looked a lot more like indigenous populations as we you know classically call them. Um, so so I, I think that um, a lot of it has to do with cities. Uh, people living in cities, right? Relative. It's a, so the point is, there's a bunch of different kind of demographic um, and structural things that kind of kind of muddle muddy that result. Part of the reason why the indigenous signal is so strong is because of geography, like where they live, right? They live in these very very discrete places, and I think we and, and, and so the signature of their of their problem is is, is much clearer. But make no mistake, there are Latinx subpopulations who had quite high rates. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, um, so I think in aggregate that might have been the case, but I think that that's not true for many subpopulations. That's really interesting. So it's kind of going back to what you're saying with environments. It's exactly right. Yeah. No, it's exactly right. Um, I think it's exactly right. It's about kind of where where people are living and what they have access to. Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, you know, I, I think there's it's, it's it's there's a lot in there in the health disparities conversation about the Latinx population in particular. I think. Depending on how you, know, you might have heard of this uh, this immigrant uh, you know health paradox, where actually new immigrants actually have a or actually do have better health mm -hmm. than 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 kind of Americans do, right? I mean, long term Americans, and part of the reason is because the family bonds mm -hmm. are actually protective. Of course, as you become American, that chips away at those families, and you become American. And the minute you become American, then your health starts to look like Americans, which is bad. So immigrants, almost independent of their income almost independent income, even when they do not have very much money, because of the family bonds, it actually is protective in terms of their health early on. So that's actually, that. so that's also in that statistic as well. So there's a lot of different forces at work there. It's a fascinating and complicated phenomenon. Great wow. question. That's really interesting. So we have a couple more questions. Um, uh, this person says, really fascinating applications of ecology to broader realms. What do you see as the biggest risks or limitations of these ecological applications in social contexts? Well, I like that. Uh, limitations and risks. So I think um, I think the biggest limitations and risks. I think the the thing that I'm the proudest of with the la with the last work in particular is that me and my data bro friends did not try to do it on our own. The risks, right? You know what I'm saying. You know how it is, right? People think you, 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 you people pass calculus. And, uh, and and college and think that they can model like racism. You better you better talk to a racism scholar. You better read some books, mm -hmm. right? Like you know, mm -hmm. I, I never ever. Now I'm gonna study whatever it is that I want to study, mm -hmm. but I'm going to read and I'm going to talk to somebody who knows it better than I do, mm -hmm. right? So um, yeah. And so that's that's the big risk is not engaging in a multidisciplinary, mm -hmm. intersectional way because you can get things embarrassingly and shockingly wrong as many people do. So that's that, that's the biggest risk and limitation, right? If we're talking to each other, um, then we'll be, I think we'll be in much better shape. That makes sense, collaboration. A uh, couple more questions. Mm -hmm. I love how COVID inspired you to do more engagement and communication work. What lessons did you learn that other scientists can apply when they want to communicate and apply their science? What lessons um, did I learn? I think I learned that this in some ways relates to another question I see that I see here. Um, what I learned is that um, we all need to expand our imagination about what it means to be a scientific, a, a, a practitioner of the sciences. Um, now, here's the thing, everybody. I'm a grumpy old scientist. Okay, I'm not like cool and hip, and I'm not saying that. I, I, I like. I'm, I ask my students. I'm technical. I better have it on my desk at Wednesday. You do not need to sacrifice the rigor of this work, but uh, at all. But right, these other dimensions are part of your job as a scientist. Okay, it, they, 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 they really, really are. They're part of what we, I think, they, part, they, they are part of what you're charged with um, as a scientist. And I think I, I saw the importance of that um, firsthand 
in, in my craft. I mean, I had people, multiple people send me notes you know, tell me I got my whole family vaccinated because of 20 minutes which you on the call yesterday. Multiple people. And what I'm saying is if you can do that with the knowledge that we have, I mean, you know, I don't know. I don't know if I've ever felt a bigger compliment than that in this profession. Um, so that that's what I learned, just how much good we can do when we when we actually care and care to communicate. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's so true. Um, and then kind of similar, do you feel that your work communicating for lay audiences, writing for Wired storytelling, is valued by your institution as part of your broader portfolio of scholarly work? Great question. So I'm going to give you um, a bit of a surprising answer. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to do the old grumpy professor answer, then I'll do the cool hit professor answer. And this is, I'm both of these people. Um, I knew the job I signed up for when I signed up for it. You can't you can't sign up for a job and then ask them to change once you, you once you signed up for it. I don't believe in that. I knew what the requirements were when I joined. So I have to publish the papers. I got to write the grants. I got to teach the classes. I got to do the service. If I didn't want that, I could have done something else for a living. Flat out. So I don't I don't do that thing. And I do I, I don't agree with a lot of people in my generation in that regard. They like want credit for their Twitter followings. Like not not like. That wasn't, that wasn't, that's not, the, that wasn't the job. Now, when you're Dean, you can change that, but that was not the job you signed up for. So what I'm saying is I do not expect any credit for it at all. Now, old grumpy professor aside, cool, cool hip professor says, I don't care. I got one bite at the apple here. I got one chance to do this job. I have tremendous trip privilege. I have one chance to do this job well. I'm going to do what I want. And if they don't like it, fine. I'll go work at Dairy Queen. I'm serious. I, I don't, I, 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 that's legitimately my opinion. So they have a right to have their expectations and I got a right to live my life the way I want to live it. And if we don't get along, cool. I'll, I'll, be, I'll be unemployed for four minutes. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. I love so, that. You're so that's my attitude. Honest. <laughs> yeah, you're truly doing it for yourself, not for the institution. No. Yeah, I love that. Um, one more. Can you talk about the process of building the interdisciplinary collaborations you've been involved in? How do you come to common understanding in terms of questions, priorities, and definitions mm -hmm. and terminology? So, yeah. Um, so, uh, great question. Great question. Let me give the... Um, let me give the insensitive part of the answer first, not to you personally, but the insensitive part of the, I mean, it, it's the good part of the answer, but it's like the, the, the harsh one, which is, I can't tell y'all how to be curious. That's like 90% of it. Do you care about the way the world works and your place in it? Once you do, read and ask people for coffee and attend the seminars over there. Like, that's really what it is. You know what I mean? But half, 90% of it is, the way that this the way this profession is into now to your to our credit and again I'll be I'll be cool cool hip professor now they squeeze us so that we can't care and I get that I get that they squeeze you and think they about protein folding and and that now you can't care about anything else anymore so what what what, I, what I'm saying is that's the thing we need to fight about you are not but the way I look at it, and this is the quick way I'll say it in terms of all these things. I consider myself in the Aristotelian tradition. I, I'm a real academic. What are they? What are they what are these other people? I don't know what they're doing. I do things the way academics are supposed to. We're supposed to be deep thinkers about existence, deep thinkers about life. And I think that's a, that's that's how I see myself. And once I saw myself this way, I think this reaching and this reading and this engaging just kind of comes naturally in some ways as an extension of who I am. But it comes with courage. It's not gonna be easy to the prior question. You're not gonna get any love in the faculty meeting from that. But so you get a chance to actually make a difference. Mm -hmm. And I think, and, you know, and that's, uh, you know, that's, that's so much more important. Yeah, do you have any tips for people who may have that curiosity but are struggling with the next step of, of reaching out and turning that curiosity into something a little bit more concrete? Yeah, no, I mean, I think, you know, so I think I do a lot of stuff in the productivity space. I mean, I'm, I think people, people, people are like, oh, you should like write about how to actually be productive. Like, how do you, what, do you, how do you, what are the actual pens you're using and stuff like that? People, you know, and I might do that. Um, 
I think that, I mean, start with things that are easy and digestible. And that is, I mean, a lot of y'all like podcasts, a lot of y'all like watch films. Dedicate a Friday night to a documentary in a, in a topic that's not in your field. A Friday night, once a week, once every other week, twice a month. Watch something that's not in your top, that's not in your field, something historical. There's amazing stuff in the world. The problem is we feel so squeezed and stressed that we don't. And I, frankly, I think it has, it actually has productivity benefits. I think that once we start thinking outside of our fields and engaging, it actually has benefits because you gain clarity for the thing you're studying. Mm -hmm. Right? So I think once you, so I think it has all of the benefits. A, you can build interdisciplinary things. You see these connections that aren't there. A, B, you, it's like, you know how when you're writing a paper and you take a few days off, right? And, and then you come back and read it and you have fresh eyes. You can shrink the amount of time you need to have fresh eyes by having another interest, right? So like when I write about sports, I come back to protein folding. and I'm like, oh, this look, ooh, that's a bad paragraph. And that was an hour ago and not a week ago. Do, do, do you see what I'm saying? And so I, I really believe in that. And of course there's limits, you can't do too much, but diverse, I really believe there's a cognitive thing we're gonna learn. Diversifying the signals in here to a point is actually good for all of the tasks. Mm -hmm. But this, 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 this tunnel vision that they squeezed us and made us think we have to, it doesn't, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't help that problem. Mm -hmm. It doesn't help the world. It doesn't help your health. It doesn't help anybody. Mm -hmm. So I would start with something simple like that. Let's regiment it and organize, but it's a way to send different shockwaves through your idea mind. And I think build on that. And then the ideas and the creativity will come with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then reaching out is just the next step. And reaching out. Coffee. I mean, I'm telling you right now, like these people, you know, everybody like coffee. Oh, I don't know about y'all, but like, you know what I'm saying? I mean, it, every department has somebody that likes coffee or tea. Some of y'all are tea drinkers or whatever. Wait, what about you? What about you, Tom? I'm from Seattle. I love oh, coffee hey all now. day, every day. <laughs> hey now. See? Exactly. So um, I, I, I had an economist, believe it or not, listen, don't judge me. I had an economist in here the other day <laughs> in my office. Hey, I but, actually studied economics. So did you? Okay, like, well, you're a nice for an economist. No, I'm just kidding. No, 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 I'm kidding. But like, and it's a joke, right, with the economists. But like, we had a great conversation about like starvation and coming out of starvation in the ecology. We had a great, like, we're going to kick around. A, I don't know what's going to come of it, but we had a good conversation about it. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? And this is the kind of things that actually leads to different uh, new questions. Exactly. I love that. Not every single coffee talk has to lead to something. No. Yeah. yeah. You're creating an ecosystem. Yeah. You want to create an ecosystem around you of an idea where like things, things have a route in, things have a route out. You have a way to act. And, and you do that enough and they percolate and boom, mm -hmm. these things really do end up. Um, and to the, to the point about whether or not my, whether or not my colleagues appreciate it or not, I'm not going to say which journal. That paper that you saw right there is in review at a very big journal. Let's just leave it at that. They're going to appreciate that. Do you see what I'm saying? But yeah. I did not arrive there trying to publish a paper in a big journal. Mm -hmm. I arrived there by virtue of the fact that I'm open-minded and I'm connect and I connect to people. Yeah. Do you see what I'm saying? And th Absolutely. these things have, end up having their, um, you know, these things have having their benefits. That yeah. I that's awesome. Um, I think we're we're a couple of minutes over time. Um. So I wanted to <laughs> thank you so much for this talk. I think I can speak for everyone that, well, I'm feeling very inspired and you got my, all my brain juices pumping. Um, and I'm really excited to see what papers you continue to publish and what research you can continue to do. Thank you all again for a wonderful job with everything you're doing. Congratulations, to everyone in attendance. Thank you for your great questions and your engagement and everyone. Good luck and be safe, please. Thank you so much. <laughs>